Good morning, everybody. All right, good to be here. Really good to be here. Amen. If you will please open your Bibles with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 7. Mark 6, 7. I'm looking for my granddaughter, Hannah, whose birthday was Friday, her 12th birthday. She might be in children's ministry making all that noise back there right now. So it's her birthday. And um, there they are over there. This Tuesday, um, coming Tuesday, August, August 29th, is Harlan and Betty Ziegler's 53rd wedding anniversary. So what a blessing. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for Hannah. Bless her this year ahead, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, We remember when she gave her heart to you. We thank you, Lord, you're always drawing every one of us ever closer to yourself. We pray you would do that this morning. May Hannah take 10 giant steps towards you this year, Lord, in her walk with you. We thank you for Harlan and Betty. And Lord, may you be praised and glorified in a Christian marriage in 53 years of marriage, Lord. And we love you and thank you for them and ask that you bless this year of marriage ahead for them, Lord. Thank you so much for them. Lord, right now we all agree and ask, Lord, you'd keep every person safe out there and we thank you for them, the men and women, all of them, Lord, that are fighting the fire, that you'd keep every home and every structure safe, Lord, Please protect them, surround them with your angels. And Lord, we do ask you to bring rain, God, and two or three days of good rain, Lord, we ask. You tell us we can ask anything we want. That's what we ask with all our heart, Lord. You'd bring rain and it would put this fire out and uh, everyone would glorify your name, Lord, and know it, it's, it's a, a godsend from you. And so, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you're on the throne right now and you're risen from the dead. And Lord, you yourself are here in our midst, Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and our King. So Lord, speak to us through your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have us in the book of Mark, and we're actually looking at you, Lord, and an event that actually happened on one day, Lord. And so speak to our hearts with what's going on in our lives right now, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Last Sunday, if you weren't with us, we were in the Gospel of Mark and we learned about John the Baptist being executed by King Herod. The Sunday before that, we had our baptism church picnic at Rowdy Creek Park. And then three weeks ago, today, Sunday, we learned about our Lord Jesus sending his 12 disciples out two by two to preach the Gospel, to heal people of everything anything and everything and to cast out all demons and he gave them his power to do that and they went out and we learned that three weeks ago so we left off with that three weeks ago we want to reread that portion of mark's gospel again this morning because today we're going to see those six teams of two returning to jesus from that missions trip he had sent them out on and so we want to refresh ourselves in the word of god today what are we going to learn about we're going to learn about the feeding of the five thousand. And when we hit that in Mark's gospel today, for the first time here, um, all four gospels record the same event. In other words, if you took Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all, this is the first time in the word of God where they all are sharing that story and different details about it. This feeding of the 5,000 today is only one of two miracles that are included in all four gospels. In other words, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have the feeding of the 5,000 where we're at today, and they also have the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead after he died on the cross for our sins. And so God the Holy Spirit wanted this story in here, and we just happen to be here today in God's timing. So let's reread it, Mark 6, 7, and then we'll go on, but we need to reread this. And he, Jesus, called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Now, we really want to emphasize this, you guys, verse 8. He commanded them, notice, to take nothing 
for the journey except a staff. No bag, notice, no bread. No copper, that's money, in their money belts. But to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Also he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now, if you guys will look with me in verse 8, Jesus commanded them, and we studied this three weeks ago, to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, but let's key in on no bread and no copper in their money belt. So number one, don't take any bread with you, don't take any money with you. And then in verse 10, he says, whatever place you enter a house, if someone welcomes you in, in other words, when you go to a village, stay there till you depart from that place. So that's lodging is gonna be provided also. So don't take any bread, don't take any money, at all, and lodging will be provided for you. So we want to remember that as we go on. Three weeks ago, we said this is a model of ministry called functional simplicity. In other words, travel light. And we talked about Jesus saying, I will be your everything. So it'd be like, here we came today, right? And we're dressed and the Lord says, go, go now. Well, wait a minute, go now. Well, don't take anything with you. Well, wait a minute, we need stuff, right? And that's happening to people. And we even have families here, right, who have had to evacuate. And so, but the Lord, he's like, well, well just trust me. In other words, well, yeah, Lord, but how's it going to work? How are, you gonna, how, or how are we going to be taken care of? Don't take any money, don't take any bread, and lodging will be provided for you. In other words, I will be your, your everything. And so... We talked about the resources of this Christian life you and I are called to live are what? What are the resources? Just Jesus Christ our Lord. Just Jesus. That's the resources. He's everything. They, as they went out, were not to be concerned about spending everything they had and about not having enough. They were called to what? Spend all of themselves. In other words, I'll take care of you. I'm calling you to spend all of yourself in ministry. So, the Word of God doesn't tell us how long they were gone, um, the six teams of two, but it was probably several weeks or longer. It could have even been months. So, if you'll jump down in chapter 6 to verse 30 with me, and this is where we're going to begin today, and let's just take verse 30. It says, then the apostles gathered to Jesus, in other words, they came back, and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. What they had done was healed all the sick of every disease and cast out all demons. What they had taught was about Jesus, and they shared the gospel. So let's remember this, though. There, wouldn't you love to hear that? Each team, what happened? There would have been so many stories right? They healed everyone of everything in his power. They cast out every demon. Well, how did he provide your food? How did you have lodging? How did you have bread? What, how did that all work? All, they would have been sharing stories about how all their needs have been met and how Jesus truly had been their everything because he had told them in how they had taken nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag. We didn't take any bread, no money in our money belts. Wherever we entered a house, we stayed there. He provided lodging. And uh, how all things worked together. Now listen, they would have been sharing stories how he had provided for them that whole time through people, right? Wherever they went, stay in the house where you're welcomed in. Don't take any bread. Well, of course they're going to need bread to eat. They didn't take any money. And so through people, he had met their every need. And we want to remember that as the story develops. No bread, no money, and your lodging will be provided also. Now, you have experienced, as I have, that Jesus our Lord will stretch us to our limits in following him and in serving him. 
So right now they're coming back, let's say after months of ministry, and they're probably thought that they had reached their own limits, right? Twice first, uh, Peter writes this, but in 1 Peter 1.22, he says, love one another fervently. Well, that's with God's agape love, right? We're supposed to love, and it's only as he lives his life in and through us. But fervently literally means stretched to the limit. So as they went out and ministered to people, were they stretched to the limit? And that's what God does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And it would just seem like we're right here in the word of God, and that's what he's doing right right now in this time, in these last of the last days. So they probably thought they'd reached their own limits. Listen, they had been traveling, and, and by the way, that's walking, right? Everywhere, long distances. Preaching, healing, casting out demons. They worked hard, put in a lot of, many long hours. They were in the midst of constant activity. It literally means they were laboring to the point of exhaustion, and they probably suffered some persecution and rejection because the Lord had warned them about that. And they were fatigued, and they needed rest. So you're coming back. You're a team of two. And as you're coming back, they, it doesn't say where they met again. It would seem it was Capernaum, which was the Lord's headquarter, headquarters in, in Galilee, up at the top of uh, the Sea of Galilee. It, it would seem that. It, it doesn't tell us for sure. But as you're coming back as a team of two, you're going, I need a rest, right? And, and uh, I think we're stretched to the limits. My legs are so tired, I can't wait till I get there. And the last thing you're going to expect is he's going to probably stretch you even more, which is exactly what he did, because he knows your limit and mine much better than we do. So he's going to stretch him even more. So if you'll look with me, please, at Mark 6.31, it says, And he, Jesus, said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they came back from months of ministering, possibly, exhausted and when they get back there's a multitude and crowds there and jump in right away hey they're back come on i need help over here as soon as you walk into the the camp right hey we need help over here come and then they just keep going and so the lord says come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while they didn't even have time to eat they were so busy so verse 32 so they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves jesus and the twelve but, verse 33, the multitudes saw them departing. Where do you think they're going, right? They're heading in that direction. And many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. And when it says they knew him, the meaning is, we've learned already, this was what the Lord did. They would minister, minister, minister to many, and then they would need a break and they would get away. And he would send the people away and they would see them get away. And what's going on here is that people know the Lord and that this is what he does and that that's what they're doing now. They're trying to get away for a rest, but they're heading in that direction. But they know that he does that. And so they're, right, it says, saw them departing. Many knew him, verse 33, and ran there on foot from all the cities. And they arrived before them and came together to him. So... Jesus and the 12 are in the boat. You're the disciple in the boat with Jesus. You need a rest. He stretched you to the limit. You're heading across the Sea of Galilee and you're looking forward to resting. You remember when he was sleeping in the boat during the storm and we studied that on Mark 4? So the Lord might be doing that again, you know, or just below like in a compartment in the boat but you're the disciples, and, and, you know, it would be relaxing, huh? It is to be out on a boat on the water to get a break. Ah, just that in itself. And that short trip ac across the Sea of Galilee, that would be restful and refreshing. Oh, man, this is great. Okay, short little rest. All of a sudden, hey, Peter, what's that on the shore? I don't know. You can see better than me. What do you think? It looks like it's moving. It's like, looks like rocks. No, it's moving like ants. What is that? Oh, is that what I think it is? And there's the crowd, multitude of people waiting. And you think you're going to rest 
and get a break on the nice green hills, right? And there they are. So stop. What were they thinking and what were they feeling and what would you be thinking and I be thinking and feeling at that time when all of a sudden, right? You go, wow. Now, same story. We're not going to turn there, but in John's Gospel, chapter 6, it says, now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. So you know what would be going on? Many people would already be traveling south to Jerusalem on their way to the Passover when this happens. And word that Jesus and his disciples are heading over to the other side, right, would have spread like wildfire and people started joining the groups running around the lake to beat them there and you had all these throngs going to Passover and that's the picture um, and it says now the Passover a feast of the Jews was near so it's shortly before the Passover near Passover so it's probably be March or early April it's exactly one year it's the second Passover we have in the Gospels it's exactly one year before his crucifixion one year later but all the grass, you guys, is going to be fresh and it's going to be green. Plenty of it because it's spring. So let's look at verse 34, Mark 6, 34. Before we read it, though, interruptions by the will of God. Question. Remember when Jesus stood up and calmed the storm, the wind and the sea, and said, quiet, be muzzled, be still? And there was instant calm, and the disciples said, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So question, who controlled the sea and the breeze that day when they were going across to get a rest? Who was the one controlling the sea and the breeze that determined the time of their arrival? See, if it had been a really strong wind, whew, you would have got away in a hurry, right? And you would have beat them across, gone up into the hills. They wouldn't know where you were. Who's controlling the breeze and the sea and giving the people time to run ahead and be waiting for them? Who's that? Right? And you guys know the answer. So interruptions by the will of God. Verse 34, whatever they're thinking is the disciples, it says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them. And it means gripped with compassion because they were like sheep, not having the shepherd, so he began to teach them many things. Matthew's account in chapter 14, same story of feeding of the 5,000, says he, Jesus, was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. So he was teaching them and he was healing them of anyone who needed healing of anything. But here's a question. How many were a great multitude? You know, we saw that in verse 34. How many? Well, if you'll just jump down to the end of our story uh, to verse 44 with me, Mark 6, 44. This is where we're going to end up today. But let's jump ahead there. It says, because how, how many are waiting and how many keep coming, right? And they're going to keep coming. It says, now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 Men. Now, Matthew, in the same story, you guys, in chapter 14, he says, now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men, but he says, besides women and children. So, if we assume that the number of women was approximately equal to the number of men, and that the number of children, they had large families, right, was at least the same number of adults, then there's a crowd of 25,000 people in our story today. So we think of the feeding of the 5,000, realistically, think about 25,000 people. Okay, if you'll hold your place there in Mark 6, and if you'll turn with me, please, to John chapter 6, two books to your right, John 6, verse 5. Same story, same day, different disciple is sharing it, so different details. And our Lord Jesus is now going to stretch Philip, one of the 12, and the other 11 disciples. He's going to stretch them even more. So in verse 5, John 6, verse 5, it says, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew 
what he would do. You guys, you know, Lord already knows what he's going to do. Isn't that great? Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. Okay, in verse 6, it says, but this he, Jesus, said to test him. Jesus had asked Philip in verse 5, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And you guys, Jesus, our Lord, will do the very same thing with us. He tests us in situations where we can see no answer. Amen? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Not so that he can see how we are going to do. He already knows how we're going to do, but that we truly might see what he already sees, how strong our faith really is. Have you seen that this week? Okay, now today, right now in our day, Back then, Philip says 200 denarii wouldn't be in, uh, it would take 200 denarii and that wouldn't even be enough to buy enough bread to give everyone just a little. Well, 200 denarii was eight months wages for an average worker. And uh, that'd be like spending, and I'm being conservative, spending conserv conservatively today $30,000 so that everyone could just have a little bit of bread. So imagine now there's 25,000 people Let's spend $30,000 and we can buy just enough bread where everybody gets one little bite, right? That's what's going on in, if we put it in our day, right? Well, that kind of money wasn't available to Philip, and certainly that amount of bread would not have been available in such an isolated place. I mean, there was villages and stuff, but not that much bread for that many people. So let me ask you a question. Who is the first person you go to? Who's the first person you go to? Answer, often it's ourselves first, like Philip right here. Then it's some other person or persons, like the other 11 disciples. We're gonna see more than likely Philip went and talked to them about this. The Lord's asking him the question first. What are we gonna do? Where are we gonna buy bread for all these people? He's gonna go share that with his brothers, right? And then much later, so first we look to ourselves a lot of times, then other people, and then we look to the Lord. So kind of here's what's going on. Philip is counting the crowd <laughs> instead of counting on our Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't the right answer from Philip have been a question when the Lord says, where are we gonna get bread for all these people? Philip could have asked, what do you wanna do, Lord, right? What do you want to do? And that's the question. Jesus asked Philip one question in verse 5, if you look there. He says, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Where? And Philip answered another question instead in verse 7. And what he's really saying, Jesus said, where? Philip says, how? Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them should have a little. And so where can we get food became how will we pay for the food, right? So it's an important switch that Philip's making here. Philip could have answered, hey, I saw, Lord, what you did in Cana of Galilee, your very first miracle. So Lord Jesus, where do you ask, Lord? With you, Jesus. That's where. That's where. With you. But instead of starting with the where, Philip started with the how, and you guys, immediately, anxiety kicks in. We often do the same thing when we see a need. We don't go to Jesus first. We go right to the how, and then we get discouraged. The first question to ask is not, how will I do it? It's, where will I go for strength? Now, you guys, Philip immediately missed this fact. Let's go back that Jesus had asked in verse 5, if you'll look at it with me. You know what he missed? Jesus said, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Me and you, Philip, where shall we buy bread? Philip's asking, how will I do it, basically, you see? And so, you know, when we were in school, we'd say to each other at recess or whatever, <laughs> or the next day, you know, how'd you do on the test, right? We all got our tests back with the, in red at the top, whatever your grade was. How'd you do on the test, right? And we'd all tell each other how we did. So question, how did you do on the test this week? 
right? The fire that powers out. Did your, it says that Jesus is testing Philip. Did your faith get tested? Did your faith get tested? Second question, did you get stretched to the limit this week? Well, let's go back to Mark 6, verse 35. Philip has talked with the other disciples. So they're getting restless. It's about 3 to 6 p.m. somewhere in there during the day. Just before sunset, it says in verse 35, when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. Now Luke in chapter 9, the same story, the feeding of the 5,000 adds this, you know, let them go get something to eat in the surrounding villages. And Luke adds, and lodge and get provisions. So in other words, let them go buy food, bread, money, and go find lodging. All right? So this same large crowd that drew out the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, annoyed the disciples. And notice they are instructing the Lord in what to do. Not one of them thought to ask Jesus for help. And the truth of the matter was probably that what's really going on is they were tired and hungry themselves, right? Hey, they don't have anything to eat, right? Send them away so they can get something to eat. In other words, deep down, we're tired and hungry ourselves. Well, let's look at verse 37 in Mark 6. Jesus now calmly puts even more pressure on his disciples. But he, Jesus, answered and said to them, You... It's emphatic here, you guys. The emphasis is on you. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? Shall we? So that's where it seems highly likely here. That's the same answer Philip had given, right? So he's talked to the other 11. And now, should we go buy that much? And so now they're all 12 together on it, trying to figure it out. 200 denarii worth of bread, which we don't have. So their answer is the same that Philip had given to them. And when they ask that question, they're admitting that they don't have the ability to meet the need of the people and fulfill the responsibility Jesus had just put on them. You, you feed them. You give them something to eat. You ever feel that? Responsibility, like what am I going to do? What are you going to do? Do you know the Lord will let us feel that? He's letting that. He put it right on him. He verbally said, you give them something to eat. He'll do that to you and I. I think everybody in here knows. We live there a lot, right? What are we going to do? Right? So they had two suggestions for solving the problem. One, either send the people away to find their own food. Or number two, raise enough money to buy a little bread for everybody. We'd have to take an offering Here's what they're probably thinking, right? As far as they're concerned, we're in the wrong place at the wrong time and nothing can be done. Now, Pastor J. Vernon McGee, now in heaven, right? Don't you love him? He says this about our story. He, Jesus, commands them to do an impossible task. They must learn, as we must learn, that he, Jesus, always commands the impossible. The reason is obvious. He intends to do the work. Isn't that great? He'll lead us over our head in an, to impossible situations because he intends to do the work. So let's look at verse 38 in Mark 6. But he, Jesus, said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. So five loaves and two fish. When it says, and when they found out, they said five and two. How long did it take them to find out? See, Jesus, our Lord, already knew, number one, we don't have enough money to buy food. And number two, no one here has any food except for one young little boy. That's the only one in 25,000 people that has anything left. So you know they've been eating all of their provision. And they've been there, you know, and, and they're hungry. Well, 
In verse 38, when Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. You guys, you know what he was telling them? Go do your best. Go out now and go see what you can find. Go do your best. And he tells the same thing to you and I. Always go do your best, right? When he says go and see, like go find out and bring back anything you can find. Go do your best. Now, question, how long would it have taken the disciples to ask 20,000 to 25,000 people if anyone had any food? You see how he's stretching them? Wait a minute. Rewind it. They went out for months and ministered. They came back. They walked into the camp. Oh my gosh, they didn't even have time to eat. They get a short breather going across the lake. Now they've got 25,000 people. And now the Lord has been having them serve all day. And now he says, go back out into the crowd and, and find out how much food they have. So they're being stretched even more. Well, what's going on is our Lord is often doing many more things than just one thing at the same time. So they're doing their best out in the crowd. You know, does anyone here have any food, right? And while that's happening, what is the Lord doing? That multitude is being made aware and prepared to look to Jesus to see what he will do now. So they're being made ready to see his power and his glory because now the disciples are making them aware we're looking for food so what's going to happen and they're looking to Jesus so that's what the Lord's doing now not going to turn you there but in John's gospel um, it says one of his disciples Andrew so we already know there was five loaves two fish one of his disciples Andrew Simon Peter's brother said to him to Jesus there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish and then he says but what are they among so many so barley loaves were the poorest of bread so we want to note that and those loaves if if they used yeast would rise to be like the size of a man's fist so a little loaf of bread if they didn't use yeast it'd be like a flat wafer and the two fish were like sardines, like our little sardines, probably dried and salted. And this is what the people would carry to eat. But you know, you guys, this is how we should always, okay, go and see, right? Jesus says, go and see what you can find. So that's the Lord always commanding you and I to do our best. And they come back and they said, we, find, we found these five little loaves and two little fish. Well, that's how we should always see our best efforts. For the Lord, we should always see them. Um, always do your best, but then whatever your best is, with whatever, whatever gifts and abilities He has given you in for His glory and to serve Him, always see that as only five loaves and two fish. And what is that among so many? In other words, I can't do it, right? And that's what's going on. Our best efforts. Now, let's remember again, he sent them out, right? They came back and said, here's what happened the two months we were out serving you. You sent us out and said, don't take anything. Don't take any bread. Don't take any money and I'll provide for your lodging, right? And so, but that had happened as they gave him the praise reports. All of that they had experienced how? Through people. Jesus had done everything sent them out, trust me, I'll be your everything. And they had experienced him taking care of them through people. All of their needs were met as they went out and preached the gospel. Where they stayed, their bread, everything, their food. So that's where they were, are, they were at, right? So what's the Lord doing right now in the story? Same thing he's doing always with us. He's stretching his disciples even more. And you guys, as he does that, he's revealing himself to them in a much deeper way because they have experienced him meeting needs through people through people who had resources to share with them now they're in the midst of 25,000 people and they've gone out through the crowd and he did that on purpose he wanted them to know there's no resources except five loaves and two little fish right and now they're thinking Jesus is limited in what he can do do you see how he's stretching them and he's revealing more of himself? Hey, he sent us out. He took care of all of our needs. But those needs were met for a couple of months as we preached the gospel and healed the sick and cast out demons through people. That's how he does it. Well, now we got 25,000 people, but there's no resources. So, hey, 
better send them away. And so you see, he's stretching them and he's, and he's taking them deeper. Um, do you know what? Matthew's account, you know what the Lord says? That we don't have here a mark. Jesus says, bring them here to me. All we have is these five little loaves and these two little fish. Jesus says, bring them here to me. So that's you and I with our best. Bring it here to me, he says. Bring your best here to me and place it in my hands. So stop. Let's think. Nothing but five loaves and two fish. And God. That's what we have going on here. So here's the question. Where in our lives, where in your life and mine, have we been thinking that there's just too little for God to work with? I don't have enough. And he wants us to know he is enough. But you know what? I want to ask a question. What if there had been absolutely nothing? No food at all. Not even five loaves and two fish. They went out and they didn't come back with anything. Zero. Would our Lord Jesus have been limited by that? See, he's stretching them and he's revealing more of himself. In Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And in John 1, first, what's the question? What did God create the world out of? What did he use to create everything out of? Answer? Nothing. Nothing. He didn't take material and then make something. He spoke it into existence out of nothing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. And the word, God, became flesh and dwelt among us. He's standing there in the midst of 20,000 people on that green hillside. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, you guys, let's look at verse 39 of Mark 6. Then he, Jesus, commanded them to make them, the disciples, all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. In John's account of the same story, it says there was much grass. So first things first, Jesus knows, right? He doesn't want any pushing and shoving. No scrambling and squabbling. Once the food becomes available, no pushing and shoving, right? So in preparation for that, our Lord Jesus had the disciples make everyone sit down in orderly fashion in groups with space enough between the groups for the disciples to walk back and forth. Because you guys, if they had remained standing, then um, they would have crowded around the distributors of the food and hindered orderly distribution. And we know that from life experience, right? If everyone's still standing up and all of a sudden there's food, what's going to happen? But if everybody's sitting down you know, with aisles so the disciples can walk and everyone's sitting down when this happens and see the Lord, you know, is doing that. So in verse 41, and when he, Jesus, had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he prayed. He blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them and the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. Now, if you look at verse 41, the common Jewish blessing before meals, and this is probably what our Lord Jesus prayed, is one sentence. Blessed, as he looks up to heaven, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the world, who bringest bread from the earth. That was the common Jewish prayer. So that's probably what our Lord prayed when he looked up to his Father in heaven. But you guys, in verse 41, it says, and he broke the loaves. And you know what broke has the meaning there? Instantaneously. In other words, he broke the loaves, so that happened right now. But then it says, and he gave them to his disciples to set before them. And gave has the meaning of continuously gave, continuously. Okay, the word of God doesn't tell us exactly how it happened, but it would seem they multiplied in his hands, in the Lord's hands. But you remember, you got 25, 
thousand people in groups of 50 and 100 and you got 12 men serving which would be what like 2,000 people each each man so they're multiplying continuously in the Lord's hands is the meaning but the Lord can do anything and so instantaneously he breaks the bread it multiplies in his hands it would seem he gives it to them they've got baskets we will see that they've got baskets or like we've seen you know um, if you've watched The Chosen or whatever, in this scene in The Chosen, they take their outer robe and they just pick it up like a woman does with her apron and, and you know pour the bread in there and the fish and you're going out like that. But you'd have to keep coming back and forth and running back and forth to doing that, right? And man, that would take a long, long time. And you know what? God's an efficient God. So it, we're not told, but what's very possible is instantaneously he's breaking the bread, but continuously it's being multiplied right there with him with the 12, continuously multiplied into what they need. And then that, as they go out and give it, it never diminishes. They just keep giving. And what's in their basket never diminishes. And it's he still up front doing that miracle continuously. That's the meaning. It's all the Lord. Can you imagine you're passing out the bread if that's how it happened? And as you're passing it out, you're going, oh, my gosh, right? And as much as you give, it's there again. And you're going, wow. And you know you're not doing it. Stop for a minute. Yeah, I'm not doing this, right? Isn't that how it's supposed to be? He's doing it, right? And you know it. And he wants us to know it. So amazing, amazing. And, uh, and so... Matthew's story, listen, this is what Matthew says, same story. It's so simple, it's a beautiful picture. He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. That's so simple. That's ministry and you and I serving him 24-7 wherever we go in this world. He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. Jesus is the one ministering, but he's doing it through the disciples. The ministry belongs to him, but it's carried on through his disciples. And so, like the disciples, you and I, we got to depend on the Lord and make ourselves available to him. And as we've said before, we are not the manufacturers. We are the what? The distributors. We're just simply, he's the manufacturer. So, sometimes we think what I've got is so little and insignificant. We're responsible to give him everything we are and give him our best. And then he'll multiply our sacrifice to meet the need. And together with the Lord, he will accomplish. We will with him his plans. So do our best and bring our best to him. So again, how long did it take you as a disciple with your 2,000 plus people to get the bread out to them even as it's multiplying? That would take a while. Are you tired? Are you hungry yourself? You haven't eaten yet. Are you tired? I, man, I thought I was at the wall. I thought I was stretched to the limit when we got back from ministering for two months. You know, then we walked into the camp. Then we came across the lake. And, and now he's got us ministering again. He's stretching them more, more, you see, more. Now, now with all of the people now filled, and by the way, when it says... In verse 42, so they all ate and were filled. Well, John says um, that they divided the food among the people, and John says as much as they wanted. How much do you want? As much as you want. And we'll get back to that in a minute. So they all ate and were filled, and it means satisfied to the point of not wanting any more. That's like my wife when I eat all of my supper, right? And she still has some left. And she does this a lot. And she says, you want this? Also, are you still hungry? And I'm like, no, I'm full. And uh, totally full, right? Satisfied. Um, now, everybody's filled and happy. He puts them to work and stretches them some more, right? Send them out to pick up the excess food. He's stretching even more. So each of the 12 takes a basket and by the way, you guys, it's a small Jewish traveling basket is the meaning here. And in verse 43, it says in Mark 6, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now that's interesting. 
25,000 people are full, and all the men, women, and children, 12 men are serving. There was nothing but five little loaves and two fish, and now those 12 disciples each have a basket that's filled with what remains for the traveling that the Lord now has ahead. What a God. Amen? This is our Lord. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so here's the question, though. You answer it. I think I know the answer, but you answer it. Their stomachs are full. The 12 disciples now have 12 baskets for the journey ahead. Question. Were the 12 baskets of fragments that the disciples picked up filled after the people had already filled their traveling baskets and stuffed their pockets. Remember, they're, on, they're going down to Jerusalem for Passover. They've got to get back to their homes. They're full now. Come on, doesn't it make sense? Take as much as you want. Well, you're going to fill yourself, and now you've got a journey ahead. These people, it's practical common sense. It's prudence, as Proverbs says. You're going to fill your basket because it just keeps coming. It doesn't empty. How much do you want? You're going to fill your basket, your family's baskets, put it in your pockets, whatever. Everything you got, you're going to fill with bread. So imagine every person filled, this is Jesus, every person filled with bread to the full and fish. And everybody carrying away as much as they can for the journey. And the disciples then standing with 12 baskets. And he's stretching them and taking them deeper and teaching them who he is, and that's what he wants to do with you and I this morning. So our last verse, Mark 6, Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. And we already know that Matthew says that's beside women and children. So about 25,000 people. John ends his gospel by saying at the very end of the book of John, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. Remember, he recorded the feeding of the 25,000. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And if you're here this morning, to believe means to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. It requires more than just an intellectual agreement, mentally agreeing with a set of facts about the life of Jesus Christ. It requires trusting your whole self into who Jesus said he was. He said he was God. And what he was sent to accomplish to die on the cross for your sins and for mine. So we have to believe in that. Not just, yeah, I, I agree with the, with the truth about Jesus Christ. No, we have to trust him and give our heart to him. So to help us understand this, imagine that you're on a hike and you're going through a beautiful mountain pass. And it's kind of hard to imagine right now, but imagine you're going through a beautiful mountain pass and you're coming to the edge of a cliff ahead that drops a thousand feet down into the valley to the canyon floor. And uh, okay, the only way to get across is a bridge from this side of the cliff way over there to the other side. This kind of, you know, basic bridge, little bridge, one person bridge, right? Now, you going to go across? It's one thing to say, I believe the bridge can hold my weight as I walk across the Great Divide. It's something altogether different to actually start walking across the bridge and go out there across that bridge. Saying, I believe the bridge can hold my weight is a kind of belief based on intellectual agreement to a possible outcome. To walk across the bridge is placing one's trust in the bridge. The Gospels were not written, our story today, just so we could know the facts about Jesus' life, why he came to die on the cross for our sins. They were written that in response to the truth, we would believe, trust in him completely, give our lives to him and be saved. Have you done that today? So let's everybody get on the bus and we're going to go visit today as a field trip from school, right? I loved those. The, the testing room of a, you loved them too, right? We're out of here. We're going to go to a large steel mill. Well, what are we going to do? I don't care. We're out of class, right? doesn't matter. We're on the bus. But we get in there, we're going to be surrounded by all these instruments and equipment that is used to test pieces of steel. 
They make steel in there. And they're going to test that steel to the limits and measures of the breaking point of the steel. So we're in there as a class. We see some pieces of steel that have been twisted, you know, like a pretzel until they broke. They twisted them until they broke. And then there's a label on that with a level of pressure they could withstand pasted on them. This is how much pressure they can take stretched to the limit, like you and I. Then we're going to see other pieces that were stretched to their breaking point till they actually did break. And then that level of strength was labeled on it. And then there's others that were compressed to their crushing point, right? And then measured and labeled with a lever of pressure that they could withstand. So the manager of the plant, he knows exactly how much stress and strain each piece of steel can endure because then it could be chosen to build a ship, a building, or a bridge. And it's the same with us, you guys, as God's children. He doesn't want you and I to be fragile like vases of glass or porcelain. He wants us to be like toughened pieces of steel, able to endure twisting, crushing pressure, to the utmost without collapse. Not like plants inside a greenhouse, sheltered from the rough weather, he wants us to be like storm-beaten oak trees. Not like sand dunes, you know, moved around by the wind, but like a granite mountain that cannot be moved by the fiercest storm. But in order to accomplish that, the Lord takes us into his testing room of suffering. And we're all in there right now, and some of us to a greater degree than others. Not speaking of myself, speaking of many of you in that testing room to a greater degree than others. So, have you come to an impasse? What's an impasse? I always think impassable, right? Have you come to an impasse in your life? In other words, our story today, is there something that seems as impossible to you as trying to feed 25,000 people with a handful of bread and a few fish? Right now, today, you don't know what to do, absolutely don't know what to do, how to meet the demand, how to solve the problem, overcome the challenge, or address the issue. You don't know the answer. By the way, this Wednesday, this week, we're making our way through the book of Exodus. And this Wednesday, at 6.30 p.m., we're doing that every Wednesday. We just happen to be this Wednesday at the Red Sea crossing. Pharaoh let the Israelites go, two million plus people, and we're, this Wednesday, going to study the Red Sea crossing. Now, here's two million people. They've got the Red Sea in front of them. Mountains on their right can't go that way. Mountains on their left. And here comes Pharaoh and the Egyptian army from behind to take us back into slavery. Trapped in the front, trapped on the right, trapped in the left, and here comes the army. Two million people. The same one that was there with 25,000 people on the hillside that day was there in the pillar of cloud during the day in the pillar of fire at night, our Lord Jesus Christ, to take care of them. So come out. In other words, they are what? Crowded to Christ. Crowded to Christ. Nothing left but to cry out to the Lord. Do you feel that way today? Is he faithful? So, how many of you raise your hand? I'm not going to call on you. So feel free. I, trust me. Have you ever heard of Pastor Chuck Swindoll, Charles Swindoll? Raise your hand. Let me see. You guys are afraid, of, afraid I'm going to call on you. Raise, okay. This is worth listening to as we close. He says, about our story, feeding of the 25,000 today. Maybe the circumstances of your life right now have come as close to unbearable as you ever thought possible. Impossibilities by their very nature cannot be tolerated indefinitely. Amen? Anybody say amen? Yeah. He says, their intensity mounts, and soon the odds multiply against us, and our minds begin to play tricks. Panic sets in. We lose sleep as our stomachs churn, and we struggle to concentrate. 
When an impossible situation drags on, our whole lives become consumed by our human, horizontal perspective of the world. So place yourself in this passage from Mark's gospel, feeding of the 25,000, as one of the disciples and make your impossible situation the crisis of our story today. If you are like most, you will identify with the disciples more than you can identify with the Savior. That's because you're plagued with the same earthbound viewpoint they struggled to overcome. Jesus saw the hunger of the multitude completely different from the way the Twelve did. Where they saw an impossible situation, Jesus saw a magnificent opportunity. We would do well to keep this reminder close at hand. When a situation becomes unbearable, we face magnificent opportunities throughout our lives, each one brilliantly disguised as an impossible situation. Your dilemma may be a domestic problem. Maybe you and your spouse have reached an impossible stage in your relationship. It may be a seemingly impossible employment situation. It may be a financial upheaval. It may be a medical issue or a relational conflict between you and another individual. It may be some sort of personal disaster you are enduring. In any case, you're at an end. It's a human impossibility. God must come through. From our limited human viewpoint, we cannot see the magnificent opportunity God sees. If we truly believe God, we must accept this fact. Nothing is impossible with him. This is his magnificent opportunity to come through. So, how can we find relief from the pressure? We put our bread and our fish in his hands. Then we follow his orders. Every time we're in the word of God and we see our Lord Jesus Christ, he gets bigger in our mind and our heart. And he stretches the disciples and our understanding of how great he is is expanded. That's what he wants to do today in in his word. C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia story And there's a young girl in a story named Lucy. And in his story, Jesus was symbolized by the character of Aslan, the lion. Lucy was a young girl, one of the characters. She's gazing into the large, wise face of Aslan, the lion, who is Jesus. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are, she asks him, older. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And you guys, that's what the Lord was doing in the disciples, in our story. That's what he's still doing in your life and mine. And I found this written by a pastor, and it's so good. And I'm going to close with this, and then we're going to worship the Lord, and David's going to close us in prayer. Now listen carefully. Many of the things we do are done out of fear and not not out of faith. Fear happens when I look at myself, assess my resources, and conclude that I do not have what it takes to do what God is calling me to do or what I have to face. Fear in a believer is a function of forgetfulness. To the degree that you forget who God is, Who you are as his child and what you have been given by his grace, fear is your default emotion. I am deeply persuaded that the only solution to fear is fear. In other words, fear is defeated only by a bigger, greater fear. Remember, Lucy said, Lord, you're bigger, right? When the fear of God overwhelms and controls your heart, it protects you from the paralyzing and debilitating fear of other things. It's only when God looms hugely larger than anything you could ever face in this fallen world that your heart is able to experience peace even when you don't understand what is happening and you don't have the power to solve it if you did understand. 
Lastly, Corey Ten Boom, now in heaven, right? Went through the Nazi concentration camps and then preached the gospel all around the world. <laughs> she says, when I start to worry, I go to the mirror and say to myself, this tremendous thing which is worrying me is beyond a solution. It is especially too hard for Jesus Christ to handle. After I have said that, I smile, she says, right? So you guys, I'm going to say a prayer right now. If you have not given your heart to the Lord yet, you already know he's knocking on your heart. Enter in, open the door by believing in him. Walk across the bridge, picture that picture. I know about Jesus, but I haven't turned from my sin and given my life to him. So I'm going to say a prayer. Stay where you're seated. Don't raise your hand. Don't get up and don't pray this out loud. Pray it silently to the risen Lord who is in the room, who's knocking on the door of your heart right now, and he will enter in and save you this morning. And then David's going to close us in worship and prayer. So if you want to give your heart to the Lord right now, but also... If you're here right now and you're sensing a great need for him and you know you're a believer, but you just want to rededicate your heart to him between you and the Lord, be led by the Holy Spirit if he's leading you to rededicate your life to him. So pray silently to ourselves and just repeat after me, but pray this to the Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God. Lord, I know that I am a sinner. Thank you, Lord, for dying for all of my sins on the cross. I turn from my life of sin now and turn around from it to follow you. Please come into my heart right now and be my Lord and Savior. And I will follow you every day from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen. There will be men and women up here to pray with you after service. So let's worship the Lord.